Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the October 26th, 2022 Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. Um, let's see, quick overview of our agenda tonight. Um, we have two continuations. The Notice of Intent for 52 Fearing Street LLC scheduled for 7.30 will be continued and the request for determination um, for New England Central Railroad will be continued. Um, we do have a fair amount of content to go through um, for uh, the 515 Sunderland Road Battery Energy Storage Facility and um, a lot of content for the 47 Olympia Drive hearings. Um, and then issue in the, the orders of conditions, we have to issue orders of conditions for Canton Ave, Lot 2 and 30 Kestrel Ave. So um, the other business has some content towards the back end of the meeting. Um, I think the big thing I just wanted to mention at the top of the meeting is it's a tough time of year. Um, we've been having sparse attendance at our meetings, which is fine. It happens to everybody for all kinds of reasons. But if you can't make a meeting, if it's possible for you to let both Aaron and I know, that would be great because um, last week, I think different people told one or the other of us that they couldn't make it. And then by the time we got to the meeting and compared notes, um, we realized we were barely had a quorum. So just if you can't make it, um, just no big deal, um, it happens, but just tell both Aaron and I um, so that we can, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. What? Yeah, I just had a realization that we can't issue Canton without Fletcher and Andre. That's right, and we had pushed Canton because of Fletcher. Uh, I will email Mark while we wait for, I don't know what is going on with, um, with Alex. I'm going to email Mark really quickly. I'm going to text Fletcher and just see if there's any way he can hop on. Even if he can hop in at the end of the meeting, just briefly. It's, I, well, it's up to you, Jen, but. Given that he shared what he shared with us, I just wonder whether that's appropriate. Yeah, I mean, if he literally has a funeral. No, it's not oh. literally a funeral. Okay. Um, he checked in with Aaron and I because, yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate oh, okay. your sensitivity. Um, based on my conversation with him, I think it's I'm comfortable just saying like, if you're not yet at this event or can hop onto your computer so we can issue can nav. All right, we'll see. I would give that a 20% chance of coming through. Um, okay, okay. Um, I emailed Mark um, just to let him know it might be an issue tonight. Okay. I don't see Alex. Um, yeah, I don't see Alex as an attendee. Um, okay. Well, I, I just saw him over there. He disappeared. Oh, you did? And he, then he disappeared? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, there he is. <laughs> he's probably confused because he's coming in as a... There we go. Alex, we can see that you're here, but we I think you're muted. There, there he is. is. Sorry for the delay. Glad I, you made it. Yeah. I should have combed okay. my hair. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh, oh. I don't, I had problems with the link in the PowerPoint. I'll have to get a lesson from Aaron later on how that works. Oh, the link in the PowerPoint doesn't work, but you should be getting a reminder email an hour before the meeting that has a link. Um, it sometimes goes to junk mail. So just be aware of that. I didn't get home till 6.30, so I thought I'd be home earlier. Busy day. Anyways, I have read your, I quickly read your update on your comments on uh, 
47 Olympia and I started to read the other stuff and then it was time to log on. Okay, thanks Alex, glad you made it. Um, so I was just giving a brief overview of the agenda um, and we had a realization that we need Fletcher um, in order to issue the Canton Ave order of conditions. So um, we're trying to figure out that situation. But in the meantime, Dave, maybe you, the next item on our agenda is an update from Dave. Sure. Um, yeah, let me, let me go through a few updates for you all tonight. Um, let me start off. Um, I had hoped to have a little more detail on, on an upcoming CPA presentation, but honestly, the last two weeks have been kind of a blur, so I don't have much on that. I know that, Michelle, you're going to be the CPAC liaison, and during the month of November, the various CPAC presentations will be made in the, in the four categories, recreation, conservation, if you will, open space, um, historic preservation, and affordable housing. So um, I have asked for uh, my request was for $100,000 for trails and bridges, um, access improvements, et cetera. And so have not gotten together kind of a PowerPoint on that, but will, and we'll share that with you all. Um, uh, Aaron was nice enough to do a, a quick search on the CPA Coalition um, website. And I, I went over that with Brad and Tyler today. And it was interesting that, that really there's about 15 to 20 properties that we've purchased since 2003. Um, we're still honing in on a couple that may not have been on the CPAC website. Um, but it's interesting, you know, it's, it's uh, roughly 20 properties that between 2003 and the present that we've purchased. Um, and so CPA dollars can only be used, CPA conservation dollars can only be used on those properties. So that's the good news. The bad news is properties like Buffers Pond, like Larch Hill, like Mount Pollux, CPA dollars can't be used on those. So so I'll, um, I've asked Brad and Tyler to kind of come up with a list of um, potential projects that are needed in, in those 15 to 20 conservation areas, the trails that are associated with them. And, um, you know, we'll make that presentation to CPAC. I, I can't remember off the top of my head when we're presenting, Michelle, but I think it's in the next three weeks or so. So I'll share that with the commission. Um, we may be talking a little bit more about land management later, but I'm, I'm excited to form this, you know, have the commission form this, this uh, subcommittee of, of the body to, to really kind of dive into land management in, you know, probably in the winter months and early, early spring of 23. I've asked Brad and Tyler, I think they have a date, Aaron, with that they coordinated through you to do a presentation to the commission in January. I think it's maybe your second meeting in January. I'm not, I, I didn't commit that date to, to memory, but I think it's the second meeting. Is that right, Aaron? So you had asked me to do that. And then Brad emailed me saying he had a, a conflict, Absolutely. but we, we can work around yeah. and get him around that time. Get you, get him. Get so that'll be nice for the commission to really have kind of a 2002 uh, summary of what they worked on out in the field bridges, parking lots, you name it. So um, that'll be kind of fun and uh, get a sense of, of the work they accomplished this year. Um, we are also kicking off two projects this week. One is at the Plumbrook Pond. That project um, was permitted through you. This is the culvert removal on the south, I would call that the southeast section of a uh, corner of Plumbrook Pond. This is uh, around the, the, uh, the, the loop trail. Um, we've hired um, a local contractor who also did the Kestrel Trust uh, culvert, if you will, on their access drive. And so this will be a culvert removal. I think there's two crushed culverts in there and they'll replace that with a bridge, uh, bank stabilization. It's gonna be a great project. We just have to hope for a couple of dry days here for uh, Chris Austin, who's a contractor from Belchertown got the job. And um, uh, that should be exciting to get that, that project done and, and get that stream free flowing. I mean, that, that those culverts have been crushed for possibly decades. So. It's been a long, long time. So uh, uh, it'll be nice to get that stream flowing. Um, we're also up in um, um, Jen's neck of the woods, the KC Trail Bridge. I, I uh, mentioned that we, we kind of took a run at that and, and probably, um, I think honestly, um, built a little bit bigger structure than we really needed there. So we're, we're kind of just gonna downsize that a little bit. 
there'll be no virtually no excavation, anything like that. But we're we're just going to work on kind of redecking something in a much smaller way on the KC Trail Bridge. Uh, we're actually going to reuse some of the overbuiltness of that project and move those materials over to the new bridge over at uh, Plumbrook Pond and, and perhaps use some of those materials over there and elsewhere uh, in town. So none of the materials will, will go to waste. Uh, but Brad and Tyler just did a wonderful job over there, but it was a little bigger than we anticipated it would be. Um, we still honestly need, the, that's what I would call a short-term solution. I would probably call that like a one to three year solution. We still need to de address the issue of vehicular um, passage over that uh, bridge. Uh, we own the land, we own the land in fee, but an adjacent farmer has the right to pass and repass over uh, the Hop Brook to get to their APR farm field to the east. And the challenge for us is how do we build a bridge? How do we afford? How do we fund a bridge that can support tractors and hay, hay equipment? So that'll be the longer term um, fundraising goal, if you will, and funding goal there. Um, let's see what else was on my quick list. Um, it's unfortunate that Fletcher is not here, but um, I understand that that Fletcher is has been talking with Brad and Tyler a little bit and connected them with some folks at Mass Wildlife. Um, they're working with, um, let's see, the, the professor is Kelly, I think it's Klingler, I may be mispronouncing that, in, in um, a course at UMass Wildlife Habitat Management. Um, and that class is I think proposing to kind of do a, a studio out there, simply uh, you know uh, looking at some of our conservation areas, and you're all probably familiar with this. I mean, we've done it with the Conway School of Do Design, the LARP, uh, the LARP uh, program at UMass, um, having students take a look at areas and and give us some some management ideas, whether it's Atkins, Atkins Flats or or um, uh, other areas, Eastman Brook, things of that sort. So I think, uh, I'm not sure if Fletcher is going to join them out in the field, but the idea would be to do kind of a walkabout with members of the class. They break up into small groups and then they they come up with, um, you know, uh, management scenarios. I get the sense that this is a, probably juniors, some juniors and seniors at UMass for kind of a fall project. Um, so it'll be fun to get their ideas. We've done this at Puffer's Pond, you know, uh, have studios focus on Puffer's Pond. Where else have we done? Have we done anything else recently in the last couple of years, Aaron? I'm trying to think um, whether we had a studio for, I don't think we had one for Hickory, um, but anyway. So um, I think Fletcher connected them with some of his colleagues or one colleague at, uh, at uh, Mass Wildlife. And so we'll, we'll get a sense of, of uh, you know, and they'll, they'll share those with us. Uh, I, I don't expect them to be at this point in the year too extensive given, uh, you know, I don't know if it's for the spring semester or the remainder of the fall semester, but there's not a whole lot of time left in the fall semester. Um, so those were the quick updates. Again, kind of getting ready for winter, still doing some brush hogging out there, um, getting equipment ready to be put away for the winter. Um, and then um, Aaron and I will work with the field staff with Brad and Tyler on, really trying to line up what projects do we anticipate trying to tackle in uh, spring summer of 23. We've still got some pretty major projects on the on the on the blocks. We've got the Amethyst Brook Bridge. We've got uh, the KC Trail Bridge, which I just mentioned. We've got what we call the um, the um, uh, the bridge over off of Southeast Street, the uh, National Guard Bridge, which was built by the National Guard about 30 years ago. Uh, some uh, undercutting of that by the Hop Brook. So lots and lots of projects uh, to kind of uh, talk about design and permit um, down the road. So uh, no shortage of work for the, the summer staff. And, and some of those projects, honestly, I think we will be um, contracting out for like the project we're currently doing that went through the commission at Plum Brook Pond, really kind of Assessing what is within the um, what is within the uh, uh, you know kind of framework for what Brad and Tyler can do versus what do we really need to hire folks to help us with? Um, our building commissioner Rob Mora has been as well as uh, Jason Skeels. They've both been very generous with their time 
And uh, some of these projects are going to require, you know, some of the larger projects will require building permits um, and engineered plans. So, um, you know, simple bog bridging and things of that sort really don't. But you get into some of these larger bridge with spans of 20 feet, or in the case of the Amethyst Brook Bridge, 55 feet, um, all of a sudden you're into uh, building permits and and uh, engineered plans. So um, we've, you know, I think there's probably not a full appreciation out there for 80, what 80 miles of trails means going over, you know, streams, uh, rivers, uh, ravines, et cetera, um, and how do we keep those bridges in good repair? So I think we got to we we do need to keep seeking funding, whether it's through CPA, private dollars, uh, state grants, but we're gonna we're gonna need more money over time to um, to focus on that. I think the piece of that too is that I've 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 um, scaled back a little on land acquisition uh, and haven't done many projects in the last couple of years purposely to focus on management and getting our house in order. So this is all part of the plan of, of updating and, and maintaining some of the land trails that we, we already own. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Dave. Any questions, commissioners, comments? Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is land management updates. Um, so the land use policy, I think Cameron, you had it this yeah. week. Yes, I looked over this week. Okay. Um, and where does it go from there, Aaron? So I sent it. I sent it to Alex, and okay. Alex has it right now. And then when Alex wraps up, it will go to you, and then circle back to me for sort of a final incorporation of all edits um and hopefully from there we're going to be doing like a a meeting where we review everything and maybe take public comment on it and hopefully approve it okay and I, I think jen i was hoping to maybe take after all commissioners had looked at it and and take i was hoping to get in on that track changes um version and and throw my own comments in there. So I'm, you know, I did see what Cameron put in there, but I've been reading all along, but I'd, I'd love to kind of wait till everybody puts their comments in and then I can do the last pass and then, yeah. Great. A, a good hard look at it. It's exciting. Sounds like a good plan. Um, okay. So then the other item under land management updates was, updates was establishment of land use planning subcommittee. Um, and I remember this is a thing, a topic we've discussed a couple of times and kind of agreed there was consensus that we thought this was a good use of time, but we hadn't gotten any further than that. Um, so I think probably the first thing we need to get a sense of is if there's anyone willing to do it. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> our hero. <laughs> I was just wondering what what's like the nexus between this subcommittee and and the plan that we might approve in a couple of weeks maybe you're getting to that also i think that the idea michelle is <clears throat> the the policy is sort of for use of the lands this would be for management of the lands so it's to come up with like sort of an overall plan for management and that is like a mowing schedule that's appropriate for the properties based on species that might be there and and we're thinking sort of holistically instead of looking at um, I mean, we want to look at the properties individually as far as a management plan, but this is to sort of come up with like an overarching plan for all lands that would like we could present a mowing schedule to the guys um, who work out in the field, we could present um, uh, recommendations for, um, you know, different things that are needed parking. Um, I think Dave and I talked a lot about this. A lot of it is like habitat related, how we manage the lands, if we're doing early successional, if we're doing forest cutting, if we're doing forest stewardship, you know, like all those different components. Um, so it's sort of more of a management focus as opposed to policy focus. And okay, you know, if I could just, if I could add, Michelle, um, I think I'd like to leave the door a little bit open on just, a little bit open, if we could, Aaron, too, on, on the policy piece, because 
I think the goal of the document that we're currently working on was really also to bring everything together to say, okay, let's get the house in order. Let's kind of codify what we know right now. We're not, I don't think we're, I don't think this document we're all working on um, breaks too much new ground. I think we're we're just kind of gathering from websites and history and and different staff and different commission commissions who made policy and decisions and um, processes on on different things and bring those all together. I think when we get the document to get uh, all done, you know, in a month or so, I have a feeling we will look at it and say, well, are there policies we want to revisit and and open up again? So I just want to leave uh, that window that that window open a little bit for this new group to maybe, dive into too. So I think you're right, Aaron, it will be focused on the management piece. And you're right, it'd be, it would be, you know, uh, early successional habitat management, uh, mowing, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, invasive species management. Um, you know, how do, how do we make decisions on what land do we put in agricultural production, back in agricultural production or not? What fields do we allow to, um, to basically, uh, 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 succeed and and not be early successional uh, 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 field habitat anymore and and so those kinds of things. But I do want to leave the door open a little bit on policy because I think there will be some things that this commission will ask questions about. And I saw some of your comments or questions in the in the margins, Michelle, just about you know even um, well dog policy is a great example. You know we have two areas, uh, Amethyst Brook and. Um, 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 Lower Mill River that allow dogs before, let's see, from dawn to 10 a.m. Is that something we want to keep? Is it realistic? Is it enforceable? You know, and, and so I think there will be elements of the policy we want to look at too. Does that make sense? Because that will drive, some of that policy will drive, of course, the management decisions we make. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And Exciting, excited to work on it. Yeah, um, you know, hunting, fishing, I've, I've interacted a little bit with Alex on hunting and fishing, camping, horseback riding. There's a lot of interesting things to talk about here. Yeah, but um, yeah, so, so let's see, yeah. So we have a subcommittee of one so far. Um, <laughs> I know you got, you got Aaron, you got Aaron and Dave for sure from the okay. staff perspective. <laughs> I would also be interested in joining that. Awesome, so. Cameron. I was gonna ask, I was gonna hesitantly ask you um, if that was something you'd be interesting in, interested in, but that would be great. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so without Andre and Fletcher here, I don't know if we want. Should we wait until we have the full one hundred percent attendance? I, and, I think ahead, that, I think that we were thinking of starting. Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe the first of the year as opposed to before the end of the year, like, because we were going to wrap up the land use policy first and then maybe mm. get this. So I don't think it's yeah. a necessarily urgent that we establish it. I think it was more for us to talk it through and kind of get a sense of who wanted to be involved. Okay. I think the first meeting we planned for New Year's Day. Yes. Be, yep. <laughs> make it a, we'll make it at 10 a.m. It yep. will be only when dogs can be at Mill River and Am Amethyst <laughs> Only. <laughs> right. When only dogs can be there. Right. So is now a time to express interest in working with Michelle? Yes. Okay. I will and Cameron. And Cameron. I'll express that's great, more. Alex. I was hoping great. you would jump on. That's great. That's awesome. Yay. Great. Thank yeah, you, Alex. That's awesome. Good group. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I was thinking of doing like maybe a, for the for the subcommittee for the bylaw regulations we did a noon on a Friday um, meeting but we can be we can discuss what time will work the best for everybody um, if it needs to be another day or something but figured like a lunch hour would be good because then um, it doesn't take people too much off of their day but we can discuss scheduling as well okay I liked that 12 to 1 that worked well for me so just throwing that out there Okay. And hopefully in the spring, we can have a field component as well and get out there mm -hmm. and Great. make sure we're seeing these areas and understanding the history, the acquisition history, the CPA or other restrictions, CR history, 
any any restrictions that might have come from the state funding that we received, all of those those layers that I, I know Michelle and Alex, you're very familiar with uh, from your professional work. So awesome. I think we're going to okay. learn a lot. We're going to learn a lot about these <laughs> these lands. Um, so with that, um, thank you everyone for your interest in that. It's exciting. Um, oh, we have a question. Somebody? Alex, do you have another question? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's uh, I don't I do not have an agenda the agenda in front of me, but Dave asked Aaron to send out the white paper on solar. And yes. asked us to read that. Is that on the agenda anywhere tonight? Um, yeah, we do need to discuss that. Um, I think I what I want to do right now is um, we can continue our 730 and shortly after that our 735 hearings. Um, and then if we have time, we could discuss it briefly before the 740. Um, I just thought hearing. it asked. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Yes, we will dis discuss that. Um, thanks for the reminder. Mm -hmm. Um, Aaron, unless you have a preference, unless that, okay. No. Um, so why don't we go ahead and issue the continuance for uh, 52 Fearing LLC. Um, so, yep, we're just looking for a motion, thanks Aaron, um, to continue this public hearing to November 9, 2022 at 7.35. Yeah, I can make the motion. So motion to move to, to, to continue the public hearing for, 50, for 46 Fearing Street, November 9th at 7.35 p.m. Second. It's a second from Alex Aaron. So voice vote, Alex. Yes. Laura. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm also an aye. Um, okay. And then for this next hearing, New England Central Railroad, they've asked to continue the public hearing to March 22nd of 2023. And um, in speaking to Aaron earlier today, it sounds like the reason for that is that they are um, making some improvements to the railroad itself and the um, Keith Morris was worried that when they're doing these improvements, to the railroad railroad itself, it will result in some movement or loss of some of the wetland flagging. So he wants to go back out in the spring and reflag, which is probably um, wise, especially because when Aaron reviewed this application and the spray versus no spray areas months ago when it came in, um, she identified a number of areas that were not flagged. So um, we are allowing the continuation until March in the hopes that the delineation and the flagging of spray versus no spray areas in, improves demonstrably from what we've seen in the past. Um, but we're also, you know, very weary of um, continuing this hearing again and again and again. Um, so we are going to allow this continuation, but if um, this pattern continues where they're not showing up to hearings and continuations continue, then um, we're going to have to figure out how to regroup and um, close the hearing and require a refiling um, because this is abnormal um, to continue something this long. So that's the update on that front. Did I miss anything, Erin? Yeah, I mean, I told him that if he's going to continue that far along that he's going to have to repost his legal ad anyways oh, yeah. and they still haven't yeah. notified abutters for this they were kind of dragging their feet on the abutter notice so prior to this hearing and this is kind of like a you know administrative thing for the continuance we don't really even need to continue it um, because they're going to have to notify abutters and have to repost a hearing to do this again um, I, I advise that because I feel like this is continuation number seven and they haven't even showed up for a hearing yet. So um, that would be fair to public to be able to participate. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Erin. So with that update, unless the commissioners have any questions, uh, we need a motion to continue the public hearing. 
I'll make the motion to continue the public hearing uh, for the New England Central Railroad, a request for determination to March 22nd, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Second. A second for Michelle. Voice vote, Michelle. Aye. Laura. Aye. Alex. Aye. Cameron. Aye. And I'm an aye. And that was at exactly 7.35, so we should be good. Um, okay, so we have four minutes before our next hearing. Should we briefly discuss this white paper um, or do we think that that's a longer topic? Is there any something else that we can cover in a four minute time slot, Erin? Yeah, I think so. Um, so we there's a couple things that are really quick. Um, the first is, um, there was a request for certificate of compliance for 150 East Leverett Road. This was a really old order of conditions for a driveway. Um, I went out and reviewed it and everything is stable. Um, so I would be comfortable if the commission um, issued a complete certificate of compliance on it. Great. So we're just looking for a motion, commissioners. Motion to issue a complete certificate of compliance for 150 East Leverett Road. Second. Uh, I think Michelle, is that Michelle in the second? Yep. Okay. Voice vote, Michelle. Aye. Laura. Aye. Alex. Aye. Cameron. Aye. And I'm an aye. Good first motion, Cameron. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Um, awesome. And then can you do this 51 Spalding Street? Yes. So this is a really simple one. Um, I believe it was in your packets. And um, bear with me while I pull the plan because I, um, I'm not sure I have it um, conveniently to just grab. But um, the project that the commission approved um, at 51 Spalding Street, you guys might recall the driveway was pretty large and extended. It took up a good portion of the um, applicant's backyard. And they have gone through a number of revisions um, to make this area much significantly smaller. Um, they pulled it out of the... Um, 25 foot no disturb but that and that was per our old regulations that they had designed it to um and i'm trying i'm queuing it up so bear with me for just a moment um just to show how much this has improved based on the <clears throat> pulling this back so significantly um i don't know if you guys recall i'm just gonna do a quick annotate the previous plan showed this driveway coming down like this and then there was like a big parking area here and it was like that so they've basically removed all of this and come up with an alternative that's much further from the wetland um much less impact and much less driveway so i would be comfortable with the commission approving this as a um, minor administrative change to the order of conditions, but it's really up to you guys if you're comfortable with that. I think it's a vast improvement across the board. I am comfortable with this as a minor administrative change. Commissioners, any questions or hesitation there? I'm happy to see they reduce the size of the driveway. So I as well, yep. The parking lot. Okay, so we're just looking for a motion to approve these proposed changes per Aaron's slide. I move to issue a complete certificate of compliance for 150 East Leverett Road. Oh, sorry. No. Holding. The top one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I move to approve the proposed change to DEP number 0890700 as a minor administrative change in consideration that buffer zone impacts have been reduced. Seconded. It's a second from Cameron. Voice vote, Cameron. Aye. Laura. Oops. 
Laura? You're on, you're on mute, Laura. She might have walked away for a sec there. Alex? Bye. Michelle? Hi, I'm I. Oh, thanks, Laura. Michelle? Hi. And I'm also an I. All right. Um, let's move into our 740 hearing. Um, so this is battery energy storage facility at 515 Sunderland Road. Are you bringing folks in already, Erin? Um, no, but I can. Uh, I believe it's Drew. Drew and Josh. Yes. As soon as I click on it to promote somebody, they change the order of the names. Yeah, I know. It always makes <sighs> the wrong thing. It's really annoying. <laughs> And if there's anybody else besides um, Drew and Josh, we can pull you in if you raise your hand. There's Josh and Drew. Awesome. Hi, guys. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, so just for the benefit of anyone in attendance, um, just a reminder of, or of our general protocol for these hearings. So um, in order to keep things moving with our very full agendas, um, we usually try to keep hearings to about 20 minutes and the structure is a five minute presentation or update um, by the applicant or representative for the permit, five minute comments from staff, five minutes for public comment, or if we have a lot of public comment, two minutes per person. Um, and five minutes for questions um, and requests for outstanding information from commissioners. Um, and so I know Josh and Drew, you're familiar with the process, um, but in this case, we'll just be asking for an update um, of any changes you think are important to notify us of before um, since our last hearing. Mm -hmm. But I also understand that you guys are looking to get feedback from us on a few things. Um, and then are going to make one big round of revisions um, for Aaron to then review, um, which we appreciate as opposed to many back and forth. Um, so unless that's changed, are you okay with giving us a, a brief update? And then we can hear from Aaron, take public comment, and then um, make sure we give you the guidance you need in order to make those revisions. Does that sound yeah, good? Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks for your time again this evening. Um, so we did meet, get a chance to meet with Aaron uh, after our last meeting um, and discuss, you know, a number of potential revisions to the plans. Uh, we just, you know, um, there was also a bit of a waiting period there while we had the test bits conducted and the results of the test bits incorporated into the stormwater design. Um, so I'll hand it off to Drew. We, we did, I know today Drew sent through you know, just because we had already made some revisions, uh, a plan uh, just to share with Aaron and we'll, and what's we'll, what we'll share on screen. Um, but yeah, Drew, I'll pass it to you to kind of go through the various um, major revisions to the site. Um, and, uh, and then we can kind of solicit any feedback uh, from there. Yep. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen, but it's, it's disabled. So Aaron, you can pull up the plan I sent, or if you want to give me access, I can do that as well. I'm going to try for two seconds to see if I can get you to be able to do that. And Drew, I, I also, yeah, I can try as well. Huh. Yeah, I don't know why something, there seems to be a change in the setting on Zoom. Um, so if. Just um, out of curiosity, Josh, are you able to share? I just tried to a second ago and it said I didn't have uh, permission. So. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, oh, I got it. Yeah, there we go. Um, what, okay. What was the setting, Jen, that you're doing? So if you click the up arrow to the right of the share screen button, it says who can share. And there's an option of only the host versus all panelists. Is that under advanced settings? No. It's oh. just to the right of the green share screen button. Like there's a little up arrow and I clicked that and just allowed. Oh, there we go. There. Okay, got it. Okay. So can so, you see that now I'm sharing uh, Aaron's memo? Yes, thank you, Drew. Thanks for your patience. Sorry about that. Yeah. All right, just just for the record again, I'm Drew Vardakis, uh, civil engineer and project manager um, now with WSP, formerly Wood. 
Um, but like Josh said, we've done a lot of work since our last meeting. Uh, we had test pits done at the site uh, back on October 12th. Um, and when I refer to comments, um, you know, generally referring back to this memo from Aaron from uh, September 23rd to the commission. Um, so as I go through um, the plan set, I'll flip to the plans here. Um, so mainly the updates uh, we on the existing conditions plan, we talked about um, revising some flagging. Um, so we went back out there and moved um, some of the flags that were not shown in the site um, down here, Wetland D. So we moved some of those uh, because previously we had located them by GPS. So we had made some adjustments in the field and then at the same day had our surveyor there and survey locate all the flags. So all of the flagging locations have been updated via, uh, via survey. So that's been done. Um, the test pits were done um, all along the proposed um, access roadway um, by these test pit symbols here. Uh, we notified the town engineer. He couldn't make it that day, but we provided records of those um, to him for the record. Um, generally, the soils were what we uh, expected them to be um, by mapping. So we confirmed the soil type and updated the stormwater model uh, accordingly. Uh, but generally, um, most of the comments um, from from Aaron and also from the the planning staff, uh, I'll mention those comments as well because we're um, trying to address everything all at once, like you mentioned, um, in one comprehensive package. So kind of doing those tandemly, side by side. But some of the comments regarded stormwater on the planning side as well. So we took a deeper dive into that model uh, for stormwater. So essentially, what we did was previously we had an infiltration trench. Um, modeled underneath the roadway. Um, so we we changed that roadway to a narrower width and added a, a dedicated infiltration trench along the inside of the road. So that way it's not co-located um, underneath the road. Um, so we have a trench there alongside the road, but then also on the southern side alongside the inside of the fence and the east side over here. So that way there's separate um, treatment um, uh, practices that are separate of the road. Um, in addition to that, there was some um, comments about containment, um, concerns about the batteries uh, leaking. So we added a, a separate uh, containment trench uh, solely surrounding the batteries that's that's lined so that if any runoff gets in there, it's lined and captured um, and uh, spills out to these uh, outlets, which then go into the trench itself. So that way it's captured and then goes to a treatment practice there. Um, there was some comments about uh, landscaping. So we updated the landscaping plan. Um, there's some details in the following sheets. Um, you can kind of see in plan view some different trees and shrubs. Uh, I will flip to that for just one second. Um, but we had our, our ecologists look at some native species in a, a very um, uh, staggered manner so that there's trees, shrubs, grasses. So it's a mixture of, of, of landscaping. And then we provided some um, potential species. Uh, and that was that was a comment that was uh, listed there. Um, and in terms of the flood storage, we talked about the VLSF last time and um, you know the 165 elevation versus the 166. It's it's our understanding that in the future it will be 165, but we're currently planning for the currently current standard of 166. So we were looking at some compensatory flood storage. Uh, initially, we were looking on the southern side here because it's just lower topography. Um, but we had a, a good call with Aaron last week uh, to go through some of these comments and changes. And she mentioned it'd be ideal to have the flood storage area um, adjacent where the filling is. So our most of our filling in that 166 contours over here, uh, where the road turnaround is. So we moved that um, essentially a cut of flood storage area from the south and moved it over here. Um, and Aaron also mentioned that'd be an opportunity to, to somehow um, enhance the existing wetland A, the, the roadside ditch that's there. So we, we're looking at putting just um, you know a cut along that, along that wetland area there to enhance that as a, a flood storage area. Um, I'm trying not to go on too long. Those are most of the highlights we've been working on. I know there's some more, but I'll, I'll leave it there um, to see if there's any further comment. I'll flip through my notes in the meantime to see um, if there's anything I missed. But those were the highlights there. And I know Josh um, had been in touch with the DOT about culvert improvements. So um, Josh has been working on that for um, concerns about the crushed culvert that, that runs along the driveway there. So we're, we're also in discussions there. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Drew. Mm -hmm. What is there anything outstanding that you need feedback from us on outside of Aaron's comments? Or do you have what you feel is a clear plan forward? Um, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think uh, we have a clear plan forward. It was it was essentially, um, you know, the plan for the stormwater was the biggest piece. Um, so the fact that we've pulled out these VMPs to be, you know, separate entities on their own and surrounding more of the site, um, adding a containment area, that, that seemed to be a common theme uh, with all the comments. So we, we think we've addressed that the best we can. Uh, also on the landscaping and species, uh, we've just provided, um, you know, a varied plan. The previous plan just had a single row of evergreen trees, but we've tried to address that with, you know, a variety of, of heights and depths and species. Um, so we, we believe we've addressed those concerns there. Um, uh, Josh, what else am I missing there? I think those were the main things, the, the stormwater, the screening, the containment. Um, the test pits that was that confirmed our soil types. Um, mm -hmm. I believe those were the major items. Yeah, I think that those were the main items as well as the flood storage uh, piece. Um, yeah, Drew's correct. So I, I, am, I am in touch right now with DOT. Um, we may need to, to obtain an access permit from DOT just to complete work within that that uh, drainage ditch area um, in terms of the the culvert replacement, but. Um, and speaking with the, the regional uh, engineer uh, from DOT, sound, from his perspective, shouldn't be any issue getting that and, and providing that, especially since um, we're not adding discharge, additional discharge stormwater-wise to that ditch. Um, we're treating it on site before it, it gets there. So um, really it's, you know, it's only a benefit to, to the DOT in terms of the, the highway drainage. So um, yeah, so I, I really think that's, that's it from our perspective. Obviously, we'll we'll wait for Erin to um, review the revised plan. Drewson over confirm if she's she's comfortable with the changes um, or if there's any other additional you know details um, that we need to to make or change. But Erin, I, I wanted to let you. I don't know if there's anything from our conversation you that you felt needed clarification from the commission um, or if we just should go with uh, go through you after this meeting. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's the idea was just for you guys to get feedback before if there's mm -hmm. any final other changes before November 9th, because I think the, the idea is if, as we move towards November 9th, hopefully we can move toward closing this and moving it. Um, I, I do have two questions. The first yeah. is whether for the containment area, there's a liner of some sort underneath the um, battery storage and then the second question was stockpiling during construction i know we had talked about that and i just wanted to make sure if there was some incorporation of where stockpiles were going to be just to make sure it's clear to the contractor yep so exactly that spill containment trench the details shown here um so that is a um that is a uh impermeable membrane that surrounds that so that collects it and then discharges it out uh, to the side towards the infiltration trench here so that's that's the side detail, and that's that's this area that is just around the battery units. So yes, that is a line trench. And then your second question, yes, we did add some potential. I think those were a couple of comments for snow storage. Um, you know, we had some areas if the plow were to come in just to push to the end of the road there, or if the gates open, you know, come in and push to the edge of the road here. And stockpiling, yes, we mentioned, um, you know, if anything, it would be temporary, um, just bringing in material for the day to build the road or bringing in gravel to spread throughout the fenced area. If anything, it'd be temporary, but uh, we did add some potential areas here so that if they're coming in on the road, they can stockpile material here and then spread through the site um, surrounded by um, sediment barriers. And uh, we still have a few more things to add to the plans here before we finalize and submit, but, um, Definitely recognize that this upper area, upper elevation area is preferred rather than, you know, saying stockpile down here uh, next to the roadside ditch where that could get filled in accidentally, you know, things, things of that nature. So is it just the trench that's lined or is under the batteries lined? Just the trench. Yes, yeah, so I think the idea being that with the high point kind of in the middle of the site, if there's stormwater discharge, it would flow into that trench where it's lined, um, and then uh, then collect and be treated before for going to the further out of the structures. So, 
So I guess the question to the commission is, so, and this, this was a, a good thing for us to just talk about collectively to make sure you guys have good guidance on it, but um, at the last meeting, we were talking a lot about stormwater and impervious surface um, because uh, the applicants were basically saying they're, um, they didn't, they weren't considering it impervious surface because of the small size of the pads and that water was just going to move around the batteries and directly into the ground to infiltrate. And then also later on, we talked about what happens if one of the batteries breach and there's like contamination or hazardous materials that come out of the batteries, then it's going straight into the ground. Yeah. Um, so that's when I had requested that some containment be added around the batteries, basically to capture any material that leaches out of the batteries before it's infiltrated into the ground. Um, I, can I go ahead. ask a question? Please. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Laura, I was waiting for a moment. Go ahead. Um, so typically, so the batteries are in containers, right? Um, and so I don't expect regular runoff from the batteries themselves unless there is some sort of system malfunction. One, one thing I am interested in knowing though is, and I don't know if this is within our purview, but um, you know, there there is a high, certainly in comparison to solar, which has very you know, little ongoing risk, there is a risk of uh, fire um, with batteries battery storage and um, because we're building so close to a resource area, a lot of times the um, chemicals that are used in fire suppression are, you know, I don't know if that's something that's the, in the purview of the commission to look at, but those are pretty, you know, they're PFAs, they can be really nasty things. Um, and I'm wondering if um, it's something that Blue Wave could address if not now, later on in their in their uh, proposal. Maybe, I can, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. And look, maybe I can tack on to that. Have you ever built a system where you line under the batteries? Um, so typically for many of the storage systems that are present in Massachusetts that I've seen built um, so far, though a lot of them are typically concrete slab foundations. There are many battery systems that don't have containment, you know, containment designed either into that concrete pad or around it. Um, and I think that's typically just due to the fact that, you know, as, as Laura mentioned, during the normal operation, uh, you know, the containers are fully sealed. They're, you know, if, even if there was a breach within the container of the cells, you know, whatever material, the, that liquid electrolyte, um, you know, shouldn't be at risk for spilling outside of the container. Um, so. Typically, so I would say out of the ones I've seen, there's there, you know, I haven't seen ones built with containment. That being said, obviously, this is, you know, it, you know, the concern from the town, both from the CONCOM and the planning boards, or excuse me, planning office. So, um, so this is a, just, you know, intent to kind of provide that additional layer of, of containment uh, beyond what the containers would provide. Um, and then, so obviously, we, yeah, and then to add on to that, for this particular system, um, you know, we propose, or we talked about these kind of concrete pier foundations, you know, you, they obviously can be uh, done with a concrete slab foundation. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where we've landed. Um, and I didn't want to address Laura's point on the P, you know, P potential for PFAS and the fire suppression agents. So um, the system uh, would come equipped with um, likely, you know, two, two methods of fires built in fire suppression. So one is a, is a aerosolized fire suppression agent that, um, that kind of, you know, inerts the atmosphere within the container. Um, that we can definitely, you know, after this meeting prior to the next, um, to kind of close that out, we could provide an MSDS for that, that agent. It's uh, non-toxic. It wouldn't have PFAS chemicals. Um, beyond that agent, the only fire suppression method agent that's used is just water. Um, no so there wouldn't be any recommended, you know, there wouldn't be any other uh, yeah, you don't use you definitely don't use water for battery fire suppression at all. So you wouldn't use it for directly on the battery cells. Um, yeah. Typically it's, it's water is used uh, in lithium ion fires as, as a method. If, if kind of as a, I don't want to call it last resort, but um, if there's, you know, <clears throat> in systems, previous systems that have been developed in the past 
where thermal runaway was more of a concern. Um, water was, I wouldn't even call it a suppression agent, it's more of a cooling agent. So really the water is just there to cool off the batteries so that that thermal runaway is, is contained. Um, typically, and this would be, you know, incorporated into um, the site uh, response plan, but nowadays for newer systems, UL 9540, 9540A systems, um, where they have to be tested to ensure that thermal runaway and fire doesn't propagate. Um, really the fire department's going to be there to use water as, as a containment um, measure. So, you know, spraying in, uh, adjacent enclosures to keep the temperatures down, obviously spraying, you know, if, if something were, you know, adjacent, you know, in the site that's outside of the container to catch fire, they would spray water on that. But generally speaking, you know, you would, a lot of these systems are kind of, there's a controlled burn that takes place. Um, the system kind of burns out and then uh, it's, you know, fully de-energized and then uh, treated. Um, yeah. Okay. So, Oh, sorry, addressing that, and um, that's something I'd be interested in knowing more about. And then, um, you know, normally, um, I don't know, um, Jen, how deep we want to go with this, but, um, you know, the decommissioning of, these are lithium ion batteries, I assume. Yeah, that's so right. the decommissioning of the lithium ion batteries I would um, be interested in knowing what the plan is for that. Um, what's the lifespan, like 10 years now? Are these expected to have it like a 10 year lifespan, roughly? Um, yeah, typically for systems where, and we're, you know, charge discharge cycle, we're expecting mm -hmm. once per day for most of the units. So mm -hmm. um, typically, you know, closer to 15 to 20 year lifespans, there may be some mm -hmm. units that, um, you know, on this site, I, I think Drew, if you want to, just flip up to one of the, the proposed conditions sheet. Um, the units that are outlined in dash, dash lines, those are units that wouldn't be installed day one. Those would be added over time to supplement the degradation of the system. But um, generally speaking, most of, if not all the units would be expected to, to last 20 years, closer to 20 years. Mm, interesting. And then, um, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say in, in regard to decommissioning, um, you know, our plan would be First, first off, we would have a de we would look to post a decommissioning bond with the town. So sure. there's funds there available for decommissioning itself. Um, and then, obviously, we would you know commit to to fully decommissioning the site, removing all the equipment, um, and uh, you know most ideally we'd be taking it to a uh, regional or you know local if there is one at that point mm -hmm. um, recycling facility for the battery as well as themselves. Yeah. I think you know I think like you know when it comes to things like solar um the runoff you know it's basically like the runoff from a solar panel is like negligible like right there's no contaminants in the soil and i think we're still so early on with battery storage um that we're not sure what the state of the soil will be after the decommission or after the decommissioning period so and i don't know if this is something we can require but i do think there needs to be some degree of um soil testing post decommissioning um, and then Dave, I know this is not our uh, purview, but the decommissioning bond should be looked at, you know, differently for, for different committees um, in this instance. So um, obviously batteries are super important. I get it as far as like maximizing renewables, but um, the technology has just got a while to evolve in my opinion, so, all right. Thanks, Laura. Those are all helpful things to think about. I have to think about how to give Josh and Drew kind of actionable. Um, can I just, can I ask one more question? Who's going to be the ultimate owner of the system? Um, Blue Wave would own and operate the system. My, I'm sorry, my company. No, I understand. Blue Wave is now owning assets? Yeah, so um, historically Blue Wave developed assets and then sold them to long-term owner, owner operators. Um, but, you know, recently we've partnered with a, um, a group called Axiom. So yeah. Yeah. nowadays we're looking okay. at it. Cool. All right. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So Alex, I see your hand is up. Um, do you have a question kind of pertinent to this conversation? If, if it's a change of topic, I want to hear from Aaron, take public comment and then come back to kind of finish the conversation. Um, yeah, it's on this project. On this on this topic about kind of fire suppression. Yeah. 
decommissioning. Okay, great. Go ahead. Um, Aaron, we just read the white paper on uh, solar and has an excellent section on battery storage. And it calls for uh, heat sensors and uh, um, a containment for a special fire extinguishing material such that if it is used, um, it doesn't go anywhere, it's, con it's contained. And I would appreciate it if you would consider what's, what's in that white paper and bring it forward um, in discussion with Josh and Drew in terms of battery storage. Uh, there's talk about uh, the BESS system and uh, I thought whoever wrote that did an excellent job. Um, and I don't know if they've already got it included here, but um, um, it's pretty clear that water isn't used and the battery storage that is talked about in that white paper calls for heat sensors uh, in the batteries to see if something's overheating and then um, a certain um, fire retardant on site to be used. And also that um, a containment system is built in so that the fire retardant material doesn't go anywhere, doesn't go into the ground. And I, I don't have that in front of me, but I would just ask that you take a look at that and then bring it into your discussion with Josh and Drew so yeah. that that subject is covered. Alex, um, I think that this question of suppression containment um, and decommissioning of the battery storage facility is pertinent to this hearing. The white paper is something that is a product of a separate committee and isn't fully reviewed or kind of sanctioned by the Conservation Commission. Um, so while maybe that piece of it is interesting, I don't think that we should kind of cross jurisdictional and project lines with that particular white paper. Um, but I think the actionable part of this conversation is um, point taken, you know, Fire suppression. Fire suppression is the subject. And right. all I did was I asked Erin to take a look at what's in that white paper and see if there's material in there she can bring to this discussion with Josh and Drew. Okay. Um, Aaron, do you have... be, yeah, just to be clear, that white paper is still under review. Yeah. And, and battery not... storage yeah. is still very new in Massachusetts and there's not yet best practices. And I think we're asking all the right questions. And I want to just reiterate that I'm appreciative of, of Josh and Drew responding to all of our inquiries. Thanks, um, Laura. good summary. Erin. Yeah, so I just wanted to say to, to Alex's point that what he's referring to is the guidelines that were issued by DEP. Um, in the Bureau of Resource Protection for the Drinking Water Program. Those are referenced in the white paper, but those are actually a DEP policy. Um, and they're very specific with regard to um, site design um, for protection of public water supplies. And um, particularly there, there are recommendations for containment for battery storage to protect groundwater and surface water. Um, so, while I agree the white paper isn't pertinent, I have read the um, DEP guidance for um, the drinking water supplies information. And I, I do think that there are elements of that that we can use. And DEP has also, in my conversations with them on previous projects, has recommended that we could um, use some of their guidance as conditions on wetlands permits to protect groundwater. Yeah, those guidelines are out there. They're not, um, they're final. They are, they're already out there. So it's, um, um, they're, that's all I'll say. Thank you, Aaron. Michelle? Um, on fire suppression, slightly different. I just wanted to confirm that there is going to be a reviewable and maybe standing um 
agreement or notification with the fire departments in the area for emergency response so that they don't get there, see what they might believe is an electrical fire and spray retardant and not water. So is that is that something that we can see at some point that that communication has been established and that um, emergency response knows what to do and what not to do in this case, since it's so close to a resource area and we don't want fire retardants um, ending up in that just due to lack of communication. Yeah, um, great question. Um, and yes, absolutely. So we, we have had a meeting with the fire department already. Um, we're as part of planning's comments uh, back on our application uh, from a zoning perspective, we are submitting um, a draft uh, emergency response plan. They'll, they'll have fire department feedback incorporated, but um, so there would be a formal plan in place. And I say, you know, that'll remain a draft all the way up until um, the construction site where it'll be, there'll be an official site visit done with the fire department confirming the as-built conditions, um, confirming all the procedures that need to be taken, where things are on site, um, all the details of the system itself. Um, so, and I'm happy to share the draft of that plan um, once we submit it to, you know, once, once it's prepared and we're gonna be submitted to, to uh, planning, they can certainly be um, sent through to the uh, commission as well. but. But that will take place and we'll we'll be providing training to the fire department as well specific to not just the site and lithium ion batteries which they, they may have already um, had some training on but specifically this 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 system in particular um just because obviously even with the same battery chemistries each system's going to differ in its own ways and so want to make sure they know the the correct procedures and uh and uh, uh order operations if you will when it comes to a site response Thank you. Great. Um, Aaron, do you have any comments or any topics we haven't touched on yet here? I mean, um, I think they've they have addressed all of my comments. The only thing I am and I'll be totally honest, a little uncomfortable with because on some level, it's sort of setting a precedence as we move forward with regard to battery storage is when I said containment, I meant containment under and around the batteries. I meant fully contained so that the materials inside are contained from um, getting into the ground. And here I see that there's nothing under the batteries. So things can still leach into the ground under the batteries. And yes, I know that there's a, a lined trench around it, but I think I was envisioning sort of like a concrete pad under and around it. So I just want to make sure that the commission understands that if we permit this and then find out that there's contamination on the site, that that's something that we can't, you know, we can't go back and change once it's permitted. Yeah. So Josh, is a continuous cement slab a possible, is, is that an option here in order to prevent potential contamination of the soil underneath the batteries? Um, yeah, potentially. What I, what I can do is, um, and what I would recommend is just the um, wood and blue wave just after this meeting, kind of look at the containment again. We can look and see based on the, you know, impervious surface added, you know, whether it kind of is, I don't, you know, I don't think I'd recommend the whole, you know, kind of that whole area being concrete, but if, if instead we can look at, see, like, if we switch to a concrete slab foundation and then just each slab had its own trench around it, um, what that would look like in terms of runoff. So we can take a look at that with wood um, and see if, if the site and the overall stormwater system can, can handle that, or if, if not, like what, what potential changes we needed, and then we can certainly follow up with Aaron um, prior to the next meeting once we take a look at that. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, commissioners, any other questions? I mean, is is um, concrete slab the only option? Is there some kind of impervious lining that could go under it? I don't know, just. Um, I guess you could, uh, so obviously the, 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 within the fence line, it's going to be, you know, crushed, a crushed stone yard material. So I guess you could put a line underneath that. Um, I think, I guess from a stormwater perspective, 
it probably doesn't, you know, if it was either all concrete or just like a liner, I don't know if it would change much in terms of that, how you calculate that impervious flow. So um, I don't want to speak out of my uh, realm of expertise, um, but uh, we, you, we can, we can we'll, we'll look at just whatever options possible. Obviously we definitely want to limit the amount of concrete on site um, just generally from a more per permanent impervious service perspective. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just take a look at however we can, you know, maximize, uh, I guess, maximize infiltration, you know, reduce any kind of compaction needed, um, but also, you know, provide the containment that, that gets, uh, that's, that is the commission's comfortable with. And I was just thinking about remediation and decommissioning in that respect. Right. That would be, anyway, that's all, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Michelle. Um, okay, I want to quickly take public comment. I'm not seeing any hands up um, and I don't want to forget. So if you're um, in attendance in this meeting as a member of the public and you have a question or comment about the proposed battery storage facility at 515 Sunderland Road, raise your hand. Um, I will allow, bring you in as a panelist. I would ask that you identify yourself and how you're related to the project um, for members of the public and the press so they can identify you um, and then keep your comments or questions jurisdictional to the resource areas um, and uh, limit them to two minutes. So I see Michael Lipinski bringing you in. Um, Drew, would you mind stopping sharing so we can see everybody? Thank you. Michael, we can see you're part of the meeting now, but you're muted. All set? Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Lipinski, 167 Shootsbury Road, and I have an interest in all things solar and batteries. And um, I think a lot of you have, have echoed the comments I would have made, which is this present plan with the trench around the batteries to me just doesn't seem like it would work. Um, one of the things that the uh, developers touted was the fact that the ground underneath the batteries was going to be permeable. That's why they were put up on pillars instead of using pads. Well, it makes sense, especially if you look at the centrally located batteries, that if there's a problem with those batteries and things are leaking out, they're going to go down into that permeable layer. They're not going to just magically work their way over to the sealed up trench going around it. And um, so I think that that design is flawed um, and it needs to be reworked so that each one of those batteries has some sort of containment. Putting containment under the entire site, if you think about it, if there's a rainstorm, it's basically going to catch all the rain in that containment system and you're basically building a swimming pool underneath the battery storage. There's no way for the water to escape. So there are some engineering problems here and I'm not sure what the solution is, but I think the uh, proposal that was made tonight, having, having a trench around the whole thing certainly isn't the solution. To me, there's no way for leaking material from the central batteries to find its way into that sealed trench all around the site. So hopefully they'll go back to the drawing board and come up with something that could contain anything that may leak out of those batteries in an emergency situation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, all right. Any other um, members of the public in attendance with questions or comments about the proposed battery storage facility at 515 Sunderland Road, please raise your hand. All right, I'm not seeing any more comments or questions. Okay, um, so commissioners, any further questions or kind of clarifying comments for Drew and Josh? I wanna make sure it's clear to them what we're looking to see or what we'd like Aaron to have to review before our next meeting. 
Um, so it sounds like in summary, if it's possible to share any kind of um, emergency response plan, it sounds like you're working it out with the fire department, um, that would be great. Uh, sounds like we're interested in a reworking of the um, current infiltration or lack of infiltration basins around the um, battery storage units. It sounds like something that could figure out individual capture for individual storage units. We'd be really interested to see scenarios there. Um, what else, Laura? Um, so fire suppression. So yeah, I think that's about the summary. And then, um, yeah, and I know Alex mentioned, uh, and I'm happy to provide some more detailed information. He mentioned heat sensors and the closure oh, yeah. on what, what their places. Yeah, I'm assuming those are already built in. I mean, that's, that's right. Yeah, but I, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so the information on that, Josh would be great, the details. Anything else, commissioners? Okay, so um, Josh and Drew usually, I mean, I know that you've got a lot of moving parts on this and that you're working with Erin on it, um, but just keep in mind that if, she, if we can have something to look at, at least the Friday before that, Wednesday, November 9th meeting. So Aaron has time to process it, can send it out to the commission so we can look at it. That mm -hmm. gives us our best shot um, at taking the next step in our next meeting. Um, hey, so um, one thing ahead. I want to make sure we we did incorporate, I think we did, we talked about decommissioning, but um, I would like to see something on making sure the soil quality is um, maintained post batteries on site. Um, I never have those concerns with, with solar, um, and I'm not certain about that here. So just want to make sure we capture that. Okay. So some sort of like, but when we want like a baseline soil sample. Yeah. And I mean, then... you, guys are already, already, you guys are already doing soil sampling. Obviously, you've done a phase one, I'm assuming, before you're built. So you have a phase one, I'm assuming, for the project. Mm -hmm. And that's telling you what's on site. So basically, we would want an identical phase one or a phase two with the recs in place to, re, you know, to, to um, sort of restore it to its original condition. Um, and I think that's actually going to be a really good precedent moving forward um, for battery storage sites. Okay, thanks, Laura. So commission, it looks like we're looking for a motion to continue the public hearing. I move to continue the public hearing to November 9th, 2022 at 7.40 p.m. for 515 Sunderland Road. Second. I got a second from Cameron. Voice vote, Michelle. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Laura. Aye. Alex. Was on mute. Aye. And I'm also an aye. Okay, thank you, Josh Thanks, and Drew. Um, we yeah. will see you in a couple weeks. Thank you, appreciate it, and we'll follow Great. you. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Thanks. Yeah, Thanks, thank you. Everyone. All right, bye-bye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Moving on to our next hearing that was scheduled for 7.45 p.m. Um, this is an NOI for SB Associates on behalf of Archipelago Investments LLC and 47 Olympia Drive LLC for redevelopment of 47 Olympia Drive, including demolition of existing structure, construction of multi-storage apartment style dormitory, associated driveway, parking, drainage, and utilities in the buffer zone to BBW and an intermittent stream at 47 Olympia Drive. Um, so I see Mark. And does Kyle usually want to be brought in? We'll ask um, Mark. Yeah, he's the he's the applicant, so it doesn't hurt to pull him in. Okay. Kyle, would you just raise your hand if you want to be brought in as a panelist? There's Mark. Hello. 
Hello. So here we are again. Um, so just as a reminder, um, and I know that you know this, but I'm going to do it for the benefit of um, members of the public who might be interested. Our usual drill here is that we try to keep this to about a 20 minute hearing. We'll have a five minute update um, from the applicant, uh, then uh, take staff comment or questions and update from Aaron for five minutes. Um, and then we'll open for public comment before taking questions and comments from the commission. Um, I know we've had a lot of movement on this. We have Aaron's Aaron's updated comments, and we have a comment letter from Jason Skills, the town engineer. Um, so we have a lot to discuss. Uh, yeah, so Mark, with that, do you want to give us an update of development since our last meeting? Sure. Um, since the last meeting, a comment was brought that we should show a swale that directs the stormwater that is flowing along the northern property line to the rain garden. Um, so I added that. Um, I have to switch screens. Um, one of Aaron's comments was to have um, a note on the plan that said no non-native plants to be um, planted within the 100 foot buffer. This is a revised um, landscaping plan. But if you look at, sorry about the hopping back and forth. Okay. Um, if you look at the uh, previous one that we sent in on Friday, there's a note that shows that all native plant palette within from the end of the bike rack to the property line, all of this area is supposed to be the woodland garden that has all native plant palette. And then from the end of the um, generator to the property, the eastern property line is also supposed to be all native plant palette. Um, one of Alan's comments that came in yesterday was the drawdown time calculations. Um, she couldn't find it in the report. I believe I did one um, general drawdown, so I broke it out and I sent this to her today, showing that um, the infiltrated, well, the infiltration retainer systems, which are two six unit retainer systems. If you use that 0.17, the minimum infiltration rate that Aaron asked for would still meet the 72 hours. Um, as those are the four inch outlets of foot above the invert for the bottom of the retainer system, that gives the same square footage or cubic feet of storage required to infiltrate compared to the same square footage of the bottom. But where we're at, while I conducted the soil test pits, I found that the soil is a sandy loam. Therefore, the walls rate becomes a 1.02 and all of the infiltration systems or areas meet the required 72 hours. Uh, these are the revised comments that we had from Aaron on Friday, or well, not Friday, yesterday. Um, as you can see, most of them um, be satisfied. There was a few minor revisions that were requested in the operation and maintenance logs. Um, those have been corrected and sent to Aaron. It was just adding more information about the uh, required maintenance in the um, box. And then um, the additional items, um, Jason Skeels sent the um, letter of his review of the storm model um, to the municipal system. And then um, we'll have to discuss the um, 
off of his own automations. Um, I don't know if Kyle wants to jump in to answer those, um, some of them. But um, so Aaron brought up that if there was a way to reduce the buffer zone to not exceed the 20%, unfortunately, the building was designed um, back in 2021 and uh, was submitted to planning board in March of 2022. So we would have to basically restart the whole design process to not exceed that 20%. Um, we discussed with Ward Smith a wetland scientist, the impacts to the wetland, and we agree that since we're filing a notice of intent for this proposed work, that there will be impacts. Um, we're proposing mitigation with like 60% of replanting the buffer area within the site, and the only area that's not going to be replanted would be the ex proposed building. And to offset that, we're willing to work or see what the commission would like to do for additional mitigation and the options that we may have. I think that's pretty much everything that's happened since the last meeting. Thanks for that overview. I think I agree that that's a good summary and I agree that kind of the um, major thing we need to figure out here and get a read from the commission on is how to handle mitigation given the large impact to the buffer on the site. Um, Aaron, before we get into that, is there anything else that you wanna make sure we cover or bring up at this point? Yeah, just for clarity, Mark, would you mind, um, so on the on the alteration, the 87% alteration of the buffer, is that all permanent alteration? or is the area that you're restoring compensating for some of that 87%? I just want to clarify that. So the only permanent um, disturbance would be, I have it on the plan, it's like 27% of the buffer. Ooh, too far, too far, sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, so the only permanent would be the 27.3% that is the building everything else we're proposing to mitigate by planting pollinating um seeds and planting the area back with native trees okay so the okay so this is an important an important item for that 87 percent, so that we fully understand this so wh what you're saying is the 87 percent alteration is during construction and once construction is complete that the building would only be 27 percent of the buffer but that you're replanting that buffer with mitigation um, to try to correct the construction phase impacts. Correct. We're trying, we're going to try to mitigate it by replanting with native and pollinated plants. And then um, that would be um, access to the manholes and the required maintenance will probably be more like t twice a year. So there's an access path for them, but otherwise, and most of those access holes are outside of the buffer, or well, the ones that are in the buffer can be staked so they don't have to actually mow and they can just find them easily. Um, but other than that, yes, we're proposing that we replant and mitigate that way within the that 60% that's not going to be permanently with hardscape. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank That's you. a big clarification. Yeah. Because I think in our bylaw, we permit 20% impact to the buffer on the site, and 27 is a lot closer. So, yeah, um, I look at the 80% as just like a temporary impact compared to the permanent degraded buffer, which is that 27. Right. Said. And it's probably an improvement to that other 60 odd percent because is it an improvement to what's existing on site now in terms of buffer quality if it's replanted with natives, Karen? I, I didn't really take stock of invasives too much when I was out there. Um, there is right now the building is 100% out of the buffer, but there's mm -hmm. 
there is a lot of poison ivy down there. That was what I observed was the ground was covered in poison ivy, but obviously that's a native, so no judgment there. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, well, let's, if it's okay with you guys, let's take public comment quickly. And then I'd really like to discuss this as a commission um, and think about how we want to handle this long-term 27% impact to the jurisdictional area on the site. Um, is that okay with everyone? I can see two people and they're not, so we're gonna go with that. Um, so if you're here um, as a member of the public in attendance to talk about the proposed project of 47 Olympia Drive, if you could raise your hand. Okay, not seeing anyone. All right, commissioners, thoughts on 27% permanent impact to the buffer zone on the site. 20% is what's permitted in our bylaw. So we're talking about 7% of this buffer area, which is how many square feet roughly, Mark? It is, I believe, like 2,000, oh, yeah, 2,000 square feet of 7,000 of buffer that's, or the total buffer that's on site is 7,000 and the building is roughly 2,000. Okay. So permanent impacts to 2,000 okay. square feet. Okay. And, but so it's permanent impacts to 2,000 square feet of the total 7,000 that's present on site. Yeah, roughly. If you using whole numbers, that's what it is. It's really nineteen thousand thirty-two square feet of permanent, but you can, you can just round up, make it easier to discuss. Okay. Um, Alex, do you have a comment or question? Yeah, uh, in previous discussions or in what I read, I. I saw um, something like 67% of the 100 foot buffer was uh, going to be impacted. How did we get to 27%? After construction, they're restoring the that area so that it during construction, there is, what is it, an 80%? 87%. 87% yeah. impact to the buffer on the site. But after construction, 60% of, of the buffer on the site will be restored with native plantings. So it leaves 27% of the buffer on the site permanently impacted. So what, coming at this again, I'm just trying to get clear on uh, the, the amount of impervious surface which will be created by the building and any other uh, part of the structure is what percent of the 100 foot buffer? That's the 27 percent. We're proposing. Oh. Uh. We're proposing to replant all of the disturbed area with native plants and native pollinating seed mixture. The only area within the buffer that's not going to be reseeded with native vegetation will be this area of the building. And in our bylaw, we permit a 20% impact to buffer. So, this is a delta of 7% 7, 7 of the jurisdictional area on the site. Yeah, I have that in front of me. Okay, yep, just and clarifying. That's section B where we talk about buffers and um, in the preamble and so on and so forth. So um, we're, I think the, there's an assumption that, um, that, if it's if there's building in the hundred foot buffer, there will be an impact to the wetland, and that's an assumption. 
and that's in the law, the rules that were passed in June of 2022. It is, it's the responsibility of the proponent to show why the wetland will not be affected. And um, I haven't seen any statement in what I've read uh, summarizing why the wetland will not be affected. And I'm, forgive me, but I, I, I'm not sure that planting native plants compensates for um, the impervious surface, which is going to be created within the 100 foot buffer, absent an explanation from the proponent on why the wetland will not be affected. And it's clear in our rules that it's the applicant's responsibility to state um, convincingly why the wetland would not be affected. I haven't seen that. So if I can just step in for one second, I think what Mark has already said as the applicant's representative is that by submitting the NOI, they are saying that the wetland will be affected. And so at issue here is not whether or not it will be affected. Everyone is in agreement that it will be affected. At issue here is the mitigation for the 27% of buffer on the site that will re remain impacted after the end of construction. Yeah, so so at, issue, at issue on the table here, Alex, is what what level of mitigation can we work through here in order to feel like we are um, compensating for that long-term 27% impact to the buffer on the site? So the first, so, step in, first step in mitigation is to avoid. Second is to minimize. Compensation is way down the list. And I would like to know what they can do to avoid the impact. And one of them is to reduce the scope I mean, what I've heard about that is that they don't want to go back to the drawing board because they're already this far down the line. Yeah. But, you know, our position is not their inconvenience, it's the wetlands bylaws. Um, so that's that's where I'm interested. Are you talking? I, okay. <laughs> I was gonna say, I think we also need to look at precedent here um, and what we've done in the past. and. Um, there's been a number of cases that have looked similar to this historically. Um, so I think Aaron, Jen, you know, to the extent that you can speak to those um, uh, would also be helpful. I don't know if Dave's here too. He's going Is the precedent ahead. under this set of bylaws? Correct. Yeah, so Canton Ave, for example, um, which we're about to condition. Mm -hmm at the end of this meeting um, has permanent impact to mm -hmm. resource area. And we they're mitigate, they're somewhat mitigating on site and they're also making a contribution to the wetland mitigation fund. Mm -hmm. um, so Which that's is something kind of, that we would be open to it if required by the commission. I didn't quite catch that, Mark. Could you say it again? I said that if the commission um, deems that's an appropriate way to mitigate, then I believe my client would be open to discussing that. It was one of the ways to mitigate, just to be clear, it wasn't the only way, but yes, here you go. Right, but the assumption here is that there's just no, there's not a lot of other space on the site for on-site mitigation. Um, right. So this is definitely a story we come at again and again and again. I mean, um, and we're still early in this well and mitigation fund process. So having benchmarks in order to attach numbers to square areas is something that, you know, we don't have an answer for in science. And so we struggle to work through it um, in this and I, I am working on that. Right, right. No, that wasn't a dig. Dave, I see you have a hand up and maybe some wisdom to share. Yeah, I stepped away for, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I stepped away for a second, um, but I think Laura brings up a good point is, you know, really what, what has been this commission's practice precedent and also um, past commissions. And I don't know if, Aaron can do it on the spot, but I wonder if that's something we could look into, you know, after this meeting, between this meeting and the next meeting is, 
you know, you mentioned, you know, other other uh, applications that are before the commission right now, but we also have mitigation. I'm thinking of Southeast um, Street Commons. Southeast Street Commons, Mr. McCheese project, where the commission did uh, um, allow uh, for some some impacts there, and then I believe I believe there were. Uh, Aaron can help me out there. What was the mitigation package there? Um, that was that was before my time. Um, yeah. Oh, that's right. That goes back to Beth. Yeah. Yeah. It was a contribution um, to the fearing. To right. It may not be the sure. best example, but I'm, yeah. I'm saying, and, and I, I recognize what Aaron is saying too, which is it's hard to really, you know, apples to apples, each project is very different, right? So it's hard to, to come up with a dollar amount to put into that wetlands fund or, or whatever, but maybe we could do a little research on uh, going back in time here and looking at some previous projects. Yeah, so the way the approach we also took at Canton Ave was we asked the applicant to estimate the costs associated with if they were able to do mitigation on site, what that would look like. And that was a benchmark for a contribution to the wetland mitigation fund. Um, just to remind people, yeah, Michelle, go ahead. I have extreme reservations with the way we handled that and Canton Ave was a kind of an anomaly in its history of the permit process. And the only reason I think we pushed through it that was because we were worried about imminent domain being sued over it. So I really don't want to stand on the shoulders of that as our precedent. And, you know, we still haven't approved that um, order of conditions, but I think it drastically falls short. And if we're going to keep doing this over and over again. I think we have to think um, of a good established uh, way to go about it. That's not just the developer, you know, giving us their short list of tasks that they think would suffice. So I just, I don't want to keep coming back to Canton Ave as, as, as how we handle things. I think that was a, um, yeah, like I said, sort of an anomaly. Mm -hmm. I think we also have some Eversource projects, but I'm not sure they're, yeah. That also was something we benchmarked in order to kind of yeah. ground truth that that can add number. So we used Eversource um, plant pricing in order to make sure that we were in the right ballpark for CanNav. But Michelle, your point is taken. CanNav is is not is by no means a, a regular case. Um, it was something that we had very few options in. Um, well, I would really appreciate from commissioners thoughts on what you would be comfortable with in terms of how we attach a dollar value to an impact like this. <clears throat> so yeah. I did a little research today on this. Um, there's in lieu uh, mitigation programs run by the state of Massachusetts. They have a pretty well-established one it's by square footage. I don't think that we should use it per se because we're working on a different scale and different level and complexity with individual projects. But there are, um, I think, Northeast programs out there that have dealt with this that maybe we could look into you know, doing some research to see what people are already doing at up to date, up to date ones. Um, that's just all I have to contribute. Um, yeah. I, so what? I, yeah. I, Go ahead. I mean, I work in a mitigation environment, so I um, I can help in the calculation of things. But there's like standards that we'd have to decide on before any of that made any sense. So, do we have wetland mitigation banking available in the state of Massachusetts? I think that might be what Mass the DFW DFG whatever. Um, is sort of doing. It's not necessarily a bank. It's an in lieu fee program. I don't think anyone's running a bank per se. It's more of a monetary exchange for. It's like our mitigation fund, from what I read briefly, um, and I can send that information to Aaron because they have just a brief fact sheet. But again, they, it's it's a larger scale project. It splits up Massachusetts, and they, um, but yeah, they have a fairly developed program. I, I didn't find their calculations per square footage, but they do have those by region in Massachusetts. Okay, that sounds like a really promising benchmark. I know like other places that do this really actively, like North Carolina is known for their very active well and mitigation banking 
I mean, it's controversial no matter where it is. Um, I mean, I did just do like a property analysis for a mitigation bank, but it's a different ecosystem. So I'm like, yeah, like I think we'd have to have some commission discussion on what wetlands are worth and water resources are worth to us before there is a dollar attached. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this is a tricky world to figure out. Um, so I don't think we need to decide on a dollar value tonight i think we could maybe i could connect with michelle and try to come up with some recommendations for i mean a short term use until we have a little more solid policy in place but um come up with some ideas that at least can hopefully um provide some guidance and then check in with the applicant on you know how they're whether they're amenable to what we're proposing and and check in prior to the next meeting on that with them. Um, I I want to be clear that I was I was unclear reviewing the plans that that 87% was not permanent alteration. And that was something when Mark was giving his presentation that was clarified for me. So that's why Thank I you. wanted him to clarify it for everyone. Yeah. So I feel much better with the mm -hmm. restoration that's proposed, but I also recognize that, um, you know, it is important for us to mitigate these impacts and um, that we need to have some sort of standard to make sure that um, there is mitigation for the impact. And I think we can do that. I 100% concur with what Aaron just said. I, going into this, did not grasp that that replanted area was mitigating and so the total final impacted buffer area is much smaller and much closer to our bylaw permitted percentage than i thought um but you know we're wading through this mark and trying to figure out you know how we can be fair about attaching a dollar value to these these resources because um, once they're gone they're gone um so is that an okay, Cameron? I see your hands up. Give me one. Give me one second. Um, Mark, are you comfortable with Aaron and um, Michelle, who has you know extensive professional experience in this area, comparing notes and coming up with a couple of benchmarks that we could use to to put a dollar value on that permanent impact to the buffer on the site? Um, as kind of the applicant, I feel like he should speak to this, but um, I think that's a fail um thing to do uh i would be um i'd like to ask the commission if they could put that as like uh the final um payment or final monetary value as a condition um obviously but i don't know. kyle can you talk about what how you feel about it Sure. I'm just, just hopping on here. Um, I appreciate Mark's efforts. I wanted to just state that uh, uh, I understand you guys are working through this. I think that if we could, we're before the planning board next week, if we could continue that process and handle these two tracks concurrently, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. And I think Kyle, the question was, so we're trying to figure out um, how to attach a dollar value to the permanent impact to buffer on the site, which is, you know, 27% of the total buffer on the site. Um, and the way we've handled this recently in projects is through a wetland mitigation fund with the town. So we attach a dollar value to kind of that permanent impact to the buffer on the site. And the um, applicant would make that contribution to the wetland mitigation fund as part of a condition of the NOI. Um, so what we've been discussing is how to do that how to um, attach a dollar value to the permanent impact of the resource on the site. Um, so the way we were proposing to do it was Michelle, a commissioner who has extensive professional experience in this, um, can help us figure out kind of local benchmarks for that uh, calculation. And then Aaron could be in touch with you um, with some proposals and benchmarks on kind of what an appropriate dollar value for that contribution might be. Does that I think that sounds great. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you. Great. 
Cameron, I'm sorry for the delay. Go ahead. No worries. Um, I agree that seeing some benchmarks would definitely be helpful in evaluating this. And I had a clarifying question about um, the roughly 60% that will be mitigated. I was just wondering, will that essentially restore that part of the buffer that's being affected? And is that why it brings it down to the 70, or the, the 27%? Um, you, my understanding is yes, and that's why Mark was sharing the planting plan um, that you saw on the landscape architect's plan view that he showed, um, specifying that it's a mix of um, native plantings and pollinating pollinator seed mix, um, kind of restoration of vegetative cover. And that's why I was asking Cameron, you might have heard me ask Aaron, like, how does that future proposed condition compared to the condition of the existing buffer on the site. Um, and she said, you know, she didn't really note invasives there, but there's a ton of poison ivy. So my guess is like, you know, BVW in a very, you know, heavily developed area, um, probably native plantings and thoughtful native pollinator seed mix is, if not equal, potentially even an improvement over what the condition of the buffer is now. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. Mark, is that Aaron, Mark, fair summary? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Cameron. Good question. Okay, so it sounds like we have a plan. Um, Michelle, you look like you're still concerned about this. Are you okay with this, this plan? I'm, I'm okay with it. It's, I feel like it's a big ask to put um, that I'm going to come up with a dollar amount for our town's wetlands, and I'm wondering what the timeline is for this. Yeah, okay. Well, this is certainly something I can help with. I'm comfortable researching this as well. I speak, I'm not you, but I speak a little bit of that language, so it could at least help us approach some Massachusetts numbers. Um, it feels like there's got to be a resource for this somewhere in, in the state. Um, I think so I th um, we're going to have to contact some people like I what I read today was um, it was information. It was like, you know, their front information for people interested, like developers, but it didn't give the background metrics on anything, which is what I would like to see. So that's why I'm just wondering about the timeline, because if it requires like contacting some professionals that are doing this in Massachusetts, that might just add a little more time and I can start soon but um well yeah Michelle, are we talking about two? I can I can do I can do a chunk of this too I don't want you to feel like I'm putting it all on you I think it's I can call and coordinate if you have some metric that you have established that would help guide us um but I don't I don't I think we should see what we can do before the ninth and okay I, I just check I'm, in, yeah I just want to say that I, if we do this, I don't want it to be the precedent that we do every time. I want us to be able to have the flexibility to improve on what we learn and keep moving with it and not just do it again and again, because this kind of stuff has been developed over, you know, decades in other places and to, to determine it once and for all, just that doesn't seem like a good approach. So that's my concern. So thank you for just checking in on that, Jen. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I understand. And I think, we would be relying, you know, we'd be asking Aaron to do a lot of the research on this and relying on you for like, you know, a straight face gut check to some of this, but I 100% agree that we can't keep like case by case basis, cop like stumbling through this because it's a slippery slope and a really tricky thing to do. Okay, Dave, did you have a comment or question or did we resolve? Oh. Okay. No, I think I'm feeling pretty good about it. Yeah, I, I just was responding a little bit to Michelle and, and something Aaron said a few minutes ago that, you know, I just want to make sure we keep keep our options open for the future. I agree that we should come up with some consistent, you know, metrics for doing this. I mean, eventually I would suggest that this would become a formal policy of the commission, that this is how this process goes. But I agree with Michelle that, you know, with the limited time we have, we we will come up with something. You all will do the, the best research and, and propose something, but but you know, stay open, you know, keep the door open in 23 to 
you know, there's new information and, and, and our, our equation could change, right? Your equation could change in, in 23, 24. So don't lock something in, but um, yeah. So I, I think you're going in a great path. This is good. Just the use of the term equation makes me like a little bit panicky, but that's okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, listen, I think the message is just like anything, even just like the battery storage project we looked at, like we're going to be, we will know a lot more in two years from now than we do now. And we just need to constantly be open to learning more and, and adapting policies. That's how I, that's how I hear Michelle's comments. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Laura. All right. So I think we have a plan. Um, Thank you, Mark, for all the detail and the overview. Um, and it sounds like we will be in touch with some ideas on what the scale of that, what the mitigation fund contribution would be um, in this case. Jen, can I, can I just add for the record, because I don't know if Mark and Kyle know this, but so that fund, I don't know if it's been stated that that fund doesn't just sit there. We, we then yeah. use that fund to um, make improvements to wetland systems in town. So um, the fund goes directly to, you know, mitigation that the town might wanna do like removing culverts on a stream and associated wetland buffers, you know, in South Amherst and Aaron helped me out, um, uh, um, uh, you know, protecting riparian corridors along the Amethyst Brook and yeah. and many others so, so that's where the money goes it it doesn't go into some fund that the town it doesn't go into the general fund of the town for instance it, it stays within the control of the department and the commission and we turn that back around to improve um, uh, wetland systems throughout throughout town and, and in this case it's working exactly how it's designed because it's designed for projects where we literally cannot for a number of possible reasons mitigate on site. And so it enables us to have funds that we can use in aggregate to have a bigger restorative or mitigative um, impact in the town of Amherst. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dave, that's a good point. We hadn't discussed it. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dave. Um, okay. Any further comments or questions? Otherwise, I think we're looking for a motion to continue to hot off the presses, November 9th, 2022 at 7.45. 7.45. So moved is fine. So moved. Just need a second, commissioners. Seconded. Seconded by Cameron, voice vote. Michelle. Aye. Uh, Laura. Aye. Alex. Aye. Cameron. Aye. And I'm an I. All right, Kyle, Mark, thank you again. We, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Thank you Have for your time. Night. Good night. Thank you. Okay. All right. That's the end of our hearings. That was a good productive discussion. Thanks everyone. Um, so with no Fletcher, can we issue this order of conditions? No. Okay. No. I think we should hold this and just let them know that, you know, hopefully they'll Hopefully they're going to be granting us some flexibility to extend this to the next meeting since we don't have a quorum to to vote on it tonight. Okay, um, Aaron, we could also do a special meeting of the commissioners who could vote on this. We could, yeah. Um, so if if you want to float that to Mark, I think that's appropriate, given okay. that we literally asked them to wait an additional meeting for this right. very reason. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And please pass on our apologies. Um, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, Estra Lane. Yes. Um, so, just to, I, I did speak with them. Um, my ask there was um, 
14 mature blueberry bushes on their property um, or a equal monetary contribution to the wetland mitigation fund, which I calculated out um, based on actually the can't nav quote, which was really convenient and they were nice blueberry bushes to $35 a plant. So it came out to $500 um, for those plantings to compensate for the um, additional lean to. In addition to that, they were proposing to do autumn olive treatment uh, autumn olive removal and spot stump treatments with herbicide um, to try to remove some of the invasives on their property. Um, and then there's just some, you know, the standard boilerplate for um, state and local residential projects um, and some additional um, requirements, just make sure that they're following the plans and they bring any changes before us. Um, they have to get all of their other permits before they start work, um, that they have to record their, their order at the registry, um, that no additional wetland buffer zone alteration um, is permitted on the lot in perpetuity besides minor activities. So, you know, their deck sheds, patios, and pools that they don't require to get a permit for us from, but other than that, um, you know, home expansion and stuff like that, they're getting pretty close to the buffer zone. So that was one condition that I recommended we include. Um, I've been starting to do sign offs on permits um, for orders of conditions, basically as a green light for them to start work because a lot of applicants have been skipping pre-construction meetings and erosion control inspections. So that's a way for me to actually have a requirement for a sign off and <clears throat> also a contractor sign off that they have read and understand the order of conditions prior to work beginning. Um, but this is a relatively straightforward one, buffer zone project, so it's not too extensive as far as conditions. Um, commissioners, any comments or questions on this? So I just remember that um, I didn't want to use the herbicide and now I'm remembering what was the, um, like the buckthorn stamper or something. Is that something we could recommend to people as like easy contained the or beside? Blaster, yeah. Isn't it just sort yeah, of the a- the buckthorn blaster, yep. Is it blast or just? No, it's okay. a, yeah. I don't know why it's called the blaster. That's actually <laughs> okay. misleading. Okay. Just like, it just hits the stump. Yep. Okay, it seems like a convenient sort of I don't know, contained uh, herbicide application for people that maybe don't want to deal too much with it. That was all. Okay. Um, should I just make the motion? Yeah, sounds good. <clears throat> I move to issue the order of conditions for 30 Kestrel Lane DEP number 0890708 with the above noted conditions. And do I read them all? As noted by Aaron. <laughs> Is that a second by Laura? Yep. Okay. All right. Voice vote. Cameron. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Uh, Laura. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Um, so we did Spalding and East Leverett. Okay. So, sorry, go ahead. Do we want, do we need a... Um, motion for us uh, what do we call it uh the executive session i don't okay. i don't think we do right now uh so okay. we, can, we can hold on that i always put that in as a placeholder just in case something comes up where you know i think we're going to need it but um yeah i don't think we're going to need it for the next okay. one okay so the last thing we wanted to talk about was the um white paper from the water supply um protection committee is that what it's called um and so I guess commissioners, you probably saw Aaron shared um, a version of, I'm just trying to pull it up, sorry. Um, here we go. Uh, solar and drinking water white paper, um, which was written by the 
Amherst Water Supply Protection Committee. It's called White Paper on Large Scale, scale Solar Array Installations and Potential Impact Amherst Drinking Water. Um, the committee asked Erin to provide some comments. Um, she shared her comments with us. Um, I guess, so full disclosure, this got buried in my email. Um, I didn't get a chance to look at it until Erin mentioned it to me today. Um, it's tricky because a lot of the discussion is something that's jurisdictional to the wetlands and water resources in Amherst. Um, so I just wanted to flag that and see if any com other commissioners had any comments or concerns about that white paper um, and what a productive way forward might be. Yeah, Michelle, go ahead. So I read the whole thing today um, and I appreciate Erin's comments in it. She pointed out some stuff that should just be included. Um, so one thing specifically that I have concerns about are the well setbacks they use. Um, my neighborhood specifically gets called out as being like basically the only place in Amherst with some density of wells. So it gets a little personal for me, but um, yeah, I live in the High Point Flat Hills neighborhood and everybody here has wells. And there's land that has been proposed in the area, mostly shoots very. But here is my concern is that the setbacks are DEP setbacks and they're based on distance to a septic system, which we also have. And those setbacks are based on organic contaminants and well waters. They're not based on inorganic materials that are can be the product of routine maintenance or you know the taking down of um, of solar arrays. So specifically what I was reading about in this white paper are the cleaning solutions, which I assume are some kind of solvents. They use water sometimes, and there was something about injection into the groundwater or just um, trying, like trying not to dispose of it on site. Um, there is something about using pesticides for poison ivy, which I see as a mistake, but there's something about using pesticides. I think they meant herbicides. I assume that maybe they might need rodenticides at some point or some kind of rodent control if there's problems on site. There's just a lot of um, potential toxic contaminants that could come not from the solar panels themselves, but from the routine maintenance of them. And all of that within a hundred foot well, I think should be considered differently than just a regular septic system, which is treating you know, brown water. Um, and they did increase some of the setbacks for public drinking water supplies based on greater discharge. But collectively, the neighborhood, you know, there's like 50 houses in just my neighborhood all on a well, and a large solar array would impact all of those to some extent um, and could come within, you know, 100 feet of quite a few wells. So I just want, I guess my point is that I think that the impacts to well drinking water, both public and private, should be considered differently for a potential um, inorganic compound um, um, contamination than it is for organic septic treatment, which is what it's based on right now. And there seems to be no effort to reevaluate it. Yeah. Okay, Laura, I see your hand. Give me one second. So I think the most productive conversation we can have now, acknowledging that there are a lot of comments that we could have about the contents of that white paper. I think what might be more productive is trying to understand how we should be involved or not involved in it. So it's a white paper from another commission. Um, it's their you know, decision to write this white paper. It's, my concern is that it's confusing if you're a member of the public in Amherst where this white paper is coming from. And I don't think that the commission has had a sufficient chance to review and be involved or seen any kind of, kind of um, processing of any kind of solid review process that would make me want to have a, us have any association with that. Um, so when I read it, yes, Michelle, I had some serious technical concerns, 
but I also think it needs to be made clear that either the commission should be, our commission should be involved in writing that and editing it, or it should be made clear in the document that we were not involved in writing it and editing it. Um, and my concern is that is just like, there are some technical things in there that I don't think any of us commissioners would feel comfortable with our names on it of ourselves or our commission. Um, so I don't know, um, and Laura, I want to give you a well, I have a comment on that, so, but. Yeah, I mean, I um, so I don't know what the best way forward here is, but for me, I just really wanted to flag that mm. either we should be involved in the process of providing technical insight on the impact of solar to drinking water supplies, or we should be make it clear that that is not our position um, or doesn't sufficiently capture what would be our position. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. I was gonna say, I mean, even with the publication of this white paper, it doesn't change our mandate at all. I mean, you know, you know like still if you cite solar and I guess it's, I guess the difference is if you are not within you know a protected area we wouldn't be looking at it um right i mean i think that's the if any if there's any solar that comes you know for development in amherst um and it's in our purview whether whatever this whatever the white paper says we still have our mandate right totally but, but it's confusing you know, yeah i mean for me i agree with you um for me i can tell you that i've developed so many projects um and I have never like seen what they are talking about, like injections. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I've never, I've never seen that. I've actually, um, so um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how, yeah, I'm not a, w just to give you guys some clarity too, we were asked as the solar bylaw working group to review that white paper and ask questions. Um, as part of the process of informing our bylaws. Um, and, but the bylaws are still not going to supersede like the conservation committee's work. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I hear you. I mean, it doesn't mean it, our jurisdiction is still our jurisdiction, yeah. right? But yeah. the issue is like, you know, when we're, we're gonna get these gray area solar mm -hmm. developments where we are going to rely on solar bylaws and those solar bylaws should have input from the conservation commission right so the concern is does this white paper somehow become you know but the white paper is not even written by the by the solar bylaw working group, right but you right? can imagine how it would be confusing if you don't know Right, yeah, like yeah. if you aren't you, <laughs> yeah. and you are either someone looking to develop solar, whether that's a landowner, or developer, yeah. or just a member of the public in Amherst. I mean, mm -hmm. that is concerning to me. We have, we have a lot of committees in Amherst, Jen. Yeah, no, I know, and I mean, I didn't even really Everyone, fully know this one, and so yeah. Everyone has their own little touch on things. So yeah, Dave, I'll exactly. Let you find on that. But in the end, we're the ones who spend the hours in these hearings and yeah. have to make these decisions. And ultimately, like it is our jurisdiction to make yeah. sure that we can protect these resources. And I just want to make sure that, you know, our integrity is maintained in this process mm -hmm. um, and that we're able to do our job to the best of our ability. And I mm -hmm. just want to make sure that that's clear. Mm -hmm. Dave. Yeah, boy, there's there's a lot here. Um, yeah, they're at, at nine twenty. Um, yeah, but yeah, a couple of points. One, I I think Laura Laura's point about you know the well, first of all, this is a draft paper, so there's still time for the commission. Erin submitted her comments, which you've all seen. There's still time for the commission to draft something to send to the Water Supply Protection Committee, and at the very least, Jen, addressing your question about, you know, what what version of this draft comes out later, 
you know, the commission could say, um, you know, could say a number of things. The commission could say we'd like to we'd like to review another draft after getting all the comments from, you know, they're they're getting comments from staff, they're getting comments uh, input from other committees, um, you know, they're getting getting uh, input from the um, Solar Bylaw Working Group, the ECAC, I believe, reviewed the document. So a lot of committees and individual staff members and and members of the public are sending comments over. So, but to your point, Jen, I think it, it would not be good if, if uh, the next draft or the final draft of this said, this document has been reviewed and edits incorporated by the Conservation Commission, this, you know, because that then gives it kind of a, a broader, you know, uh, stamp of approval, if you will. Right. Um, but I, I, I think there are so many elements here. There, there potentially are solar projects that won't, that the commission really won't have jurisdiction over because if, if they don't impact resource areas and right. some of those we, we know about may be coming. So, you know, we, we've heard about. Um, but at the same time, I think, I think it's also important to note that this commission, I don't think your purview I could be wrong on this, but I don't think your purview is really the protection of drinking water in Amherst. I think it's the Water Supply Protection Committee's purview for for safe drinking water. I think, I don't know, I, we'd have to really look at your charge. I, you yeah. Know, it's a resource, but... I think that's a technical liability, right? Because I can imagine a lot of overlap between what's considered a drinking water protection area and our jurisdiction. Wow. Uh, the, first, the first interest of the Wetland Protection Act is protection of public and private water supplies. Is it? Okay, so, so going to Michelle's point earlier, yeah, I think the paper does not give enough, give enough um, emphasis on two areas that jumped out at me. One, as Michelle pointed out, was private wells. It really is focused on on public wells and public sources reservoirs and and wells but i think the water supply protection committee also um drafted it with other communities in mind i know they did um particularly shootsbury and pelham so um i think they you know again i, I think they're getting i think they're going to be surprised by how much input they get um, and I think the, the commission, certainly, Jen, you could pen something from the commission that could be sent from the commission and not staff. Right. That, that kind of characterizes yeah. where the commission is. Right. Um, the other thing is, you know, the commission could come out, come, you could develop your own, your own white paper on this topic. There's nothing that that stops the commission, uh, the the concom from doing that. Right. Thoughts on that, commissioners? Best route forward. I mean, <laughs> I don't really think like we have to evaluate jurisdictional cases like this on such a detailed case by case basis. I'm not sure it's appropriate for us to be writing a white paper. I personally feel like the science behind that's a dissertation thesis. Mm -hmm. um, in order to be done right. Uh, so I don't think it's really our job to do that. I'm more interested in how we handle our inclusion or lack of inclusion in the white paper. Um, but I really, I'm really interested to hear what other people have to say. I also know that it's 924 and everyone's being probably fried. Um, so I don't want to belabor this. If, if I'm flagging something that isn't to be necessary to be talked about this much. Um, but I also think it's there's time sensitivity here. You'd have to kind of decide what to do before our next meeting, I think. Yeah, uh, Laura? I think Alex was first. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Go ahead Laura. No, I was just gonna say, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually, it's interesting that both committees are sub, are required to protect public and private drinking water supplies. And maybe just the only difference here is that their mandate is broader beyond Amherst, but it does feel a little weird 
Um, so I feel like, I think it'd be ridiculous if we had our own white paper um, and no one's got time for that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm still not totally intended, like clear on, I mean, if anything, I think in my mind, there's like two paths. It's either we review it and heavily mark it up mm -hmm. um, or we say, hey, we're not like, this is not us. You know, like when you come in right. front of us, we're going to do it different. So that's you and you're not really reviewing projects and here's us and we're reviewing projects. And that frankly was my instinct was asked them to add a caveat to the front that this is not does not reflect mm -hmm. on the yeah, yeah. roles and responsibilities of the Conservation yeah. Commission when yeah, reviewing yeah. solar projects within yeah, our jurisdiction. It's going to take us like many, many hours to collectively right. put our, I mean, it would be, you'd like quadruple the size of that document, so. Right. Not to mention that some of it is just not known by science. <laughs> Um, Alex, sorry about that. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm. I took a little bit different uh, tact when I read it. I first of all, I really appreciate Dave asking Jen to send it out, and Dave had a purpose in in sending it out uh, so that we'd all be informed. And I'm reminded that in the battery storage project tonight, we talked about infiltration to groundwater with the idea of protecting groundwater. Um, if that's not our jurisdiction, then why are we talking about that in the battery project? And Jen went to great length to try and protect the wetland from things that might come out of the batteries. And she asked for liners. And what I hear the group saying is they want to back away from that, that that's not our charge. And yeah. I, I don't <laughs> buy that. No, I that's not what it is your charge. Yeah, that's but not I, what the group is also, saying. This is our charge, Alex. I also very much appreciated the work that this group did. They did a tremendous amount of work. And I'm sorry, Laura, but I haven't, I'm new at this, so I haven't read anything from your group. This is the first on um, um, solar and impact amorous drinking water, which has ramifications on things that we talked about tonight, for example. They did a beautiful job, I thought, of summarizing concerns about batteries. And a lot of the documents that they cited are already out there. And um, it may be a draft paper, but they cited a lot of things that are already out there for guidance. And we dealt, we talked tonight about uh, fire and um, contaminants that come from stuff and that's all discussed in this paper. I I very much appreciated the work that they did putting pulling it together. Um, I learned something and um, I, I learned a great deal and I really appreciate the work that they had to do to pull it together and I appreciate Dave sending it out to us. <sighs> Yeah, so just a couple of points, Alex. So just to be clear, my concern about it is because protecting drinking water is our charge. So my concern is that, that it could be um, construed or confused that this white paper has, says something about how the our conservation commission deals with jurisdictional solar projects. And I'm I just want to make sure that 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 is not our position. You know, we have a regulatory responsibility. We don't have a white paper that explains what we do. And I just want to make sure that that is clear. I am by no means saying that that, you know, there that everything in the paper is wrong. That is not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying that I want to make sure it's clear that that is not that when we get a project, a jurisdictional solar development project, we're going to follow our rules and regulations. It It is not going to be captured by a white paper by the drinking water supply protection. Yeah, I didn't get the sense that this paper treads on the responsibilities of the CONCOM. Yeah, it does though. 
That's I think that's what we're talking about because our our mandate is absolutely to protect public and private drinking water. And you received your enormous binder when you signed up to the commission. And that's essentially, those are essentially the guidelines that we have to adhere to. And what you're hearing, at least Jen and Aaron say, is that if we were going to um, fully, because I, listen, Jack did a great job running that, you know, group to, you know, sort of educate people on, you know, solar and so forth when it comes to um, drinking water. But that is also, um, the way I look at that is that it, that is also for areas that are beyond our jurisdictional control in the Conservation Commission, mm -hmm. because you might get a solar project that's cited not anywhere near where we're looking or where we do our work. And those are good guidelines. Um, but just for the record, when we spoke about this white paper at our last solar working group meeting, um, solar is a very well known technology. Batteries are still emerging. And um, when this concept of batteries was introduced in this paper, the caveat is this is a brand new field. There are not guidelines yet. There are not best practices known. There are a lot of resources out there, but we are still learning very much as we're going along. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's gonna be an evolution for sure. So anyways, that's a little bit digressing, but. Um, Can I suggest one other option? given the late hour and um, which might be, and I, and I realize everybody has a lot on their plate, but I guess, um, you know, I want to, I want to kind of acknowledge that the members of the, you know, Jack Jemsick and Brian Yellen and other folks, Lyons Witten, you know, spent a lot of time researching and, you know, they have the best of intentions with, with this paper. I don't think that's been really said. However, um, I think you've outlined a number of, of um, concerns you have, but one thing we could do is, is somebody representing the commission could ask to speak at their next meeting where the paper will be um, discussed. And, you know, I mean, Aaron or I, you know, could, you know, be, you know, speak for the commission, but it would be much more effective, I think, if a member of the commission could go to their meeting when the paper will be discussed and, and explore some of these issues. And that way at least get them on record with them and have a, have a discussion about the jurisdictional issues. And, and I think it was said earlier, I mean, clearly their purview is, is broader in some ways than the commission's authority is. In other words, you can have a solar project that you all may not may not come before the commission, but it still could impact groundwater, right? Totally. Kind yeah. of interesting to think about that because your purview does include the the protection of of drinking water and groundwater and surface water, and but yet, from a permitting standpoint, you that may not come that you know there are projects that won't come before you, right? Uh, um, so, and so it's a, it's a weird gray area. But they may be asked to comment on, and this is the reason for this paper, they are going to be asked to comment on projects, solar projects and battery storage projects or combination projects in both Amherst, Shutesbury and Pelham. Right. And so, but I think going to their meeting, reaching out and saying, hey, I don't know if you, you know, I don't know if you all realize, but there's shared um, interests here and shared jurisdictions and shared um, goals. And yeah. how do we how do we reach some compromise there so that there isn't misinformation? I think, Jen, that was a really good point you made earlier, which is, you know, you, you want to make sure that people realize that the CONCOM has, has authority and powers that, that can protect these resources as well. Right. Yeah, that's a good, that would be actionable. Um, their next meeting, it looks like I was on their website, it looks like their next meeting is sometime in January or something. Is that? Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head, but okay. we could easily get that information. Yeah, yeah. okay. Michelle, sorry, you had your hand raised. I guess I just want to state that I'm sort of concerned about the whole of 
there's a hole in our jurisdiction and how this would affect, you know, the potential effects on groundwater and drinking water, like that we may never see come before us. So I, I don't know what I'm trying to suggest or anything with that, but that maybe we should have some input there somehow, because I would hate to see that just get away from us because um, it's pretty important. And um, I don't, I mean, are we going to request that they like stamp a not um, so, like approved or reviewed by CONCOM or should, you know, as a memo to them stating that we haven't reviewed it or we have, may have our own positions on things? Um, is that, well, is that again, useful? That's why, that's why I was suggesting mm -hmm. We could reach out to them. I mean, it could be chair to chair, just having a Yeah, it doesn't have to be, yeah. right. That's a good point. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be in writing initially. You know, we could have a conversation and see where they are on it. Um, but I agree, Michelle, you know, I'm my eye is on that. You know, I, I just don't want it to be confusing. <laughs> um, I think Lyons Witten is the current chair, if I'm not mistaken. He's an LSP. I don't know if he's a... Geologist or hydrogeologist, I don't know his full background, but I know he's a licensed site professional and does a lot of work with, with uh, contamination, as a matter yeah. of fact. Um, right. But, you know, it could be something, Jen, where, I, again, I, I know you have a full plate, um, but reaching out to Lions and saying, hey, we have these concerns, we talked about at this meeting, it, how, how do you suggest we interface with, with you on this white paper? We have concerns, but we also think it's a great opportunity to to come together and make sure we're all on the same page because we, we all have the same goals. Right. We want to protect you know, surface wetlands, surface sources of water, um, private wells and public wells, both in Amherst and the surrounding towns. Now, again, they have no jurisdiction, neither do you in other towns, right? right. Um, part of this paper was recognizing that Pelham, Leverett and Shutesbury do not have the deep uh, technical resources that Amherst does. Right. So, Part of it was right. to yeah provide, they have our uh, yeah. water supply yeah right yes but part of it was to provide them and their boards and committees with some some um, at least a framework so yeah but I think a, a call would would really move us forward and that might result then in a member or two of the commission it doesn't you know obviously it can't be a quorum unless the meetings are posted as as um, you know uh, 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 full meetings in the commission but it could be two members of the commission going to their next meeting and articulating these, these points. That sounds like a good um, path, way to navigate this. Um, there's been a hand up from a member of the public in attendance for a while. Um, so I'm gonna let Jenny um, ask a question. Um, I thought I just brought her in. Oh, yeah. Nope. You're on mute, go. Jenny. Oh, there you are. Thank okay. you. Okay. You hear me now? Yes. yes. It's very late, and I apologize. Uh, Jenny Kalick, I live on Shutesbury Road, and I appreciate this conversation enormously. I just wanted to follow up with what Michelle mentioned about a space where drinking water is not protected. The Board of Health is charged with protecting the private well water. Uh, they were offered a seat on the solar bylaw uh, working group and they chose not to fill it. They were also sent the white paper draft and we went to their meeting last week and they hadn't read it or distributed it at that point. So the concern for people on wells is that the Board of Health, which should uh, technically be advocating and watching for our water seems to not be fully participating in all of the conversations that are ongoing. 
So if we could rely on the Conservation Commission, we would not be worried because we know all of you are attentive. Uh, but the Water Supply Protection Committee is focusing more on public wells than it is on private wells. We are a kind of footnote in the white paper. Uh, so that leaves private wells sort of as an orphan. No board of health attention, no representation on the solar bylaw working group, and a sort of afterthought on the water supply protection committee, including in the uh, white paper. So the point that Michelle made and Jen is pointing to all of you are thinking about, uh, that private water seems to be uh, losing any kind of attention so I don't know what we can do. Uh, maybe people in town can, can figure out a way to get the Board of Health uh, to be more active and more involved in it, which, which would help. But there is a huge uh, disadvantage being on private water and not having the attention of all the expertise uh, that exists in town. So thanks for hearing me so late and all your work. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for hanging in, Jenny. Point, point taken. We're going to try to figure out how to navigate this. And just to that point, Jen, I, I'm happy. I just made, sent a note to myself that I will follow up with um, Jennifer Brown, our health director, on really trying to see if we can get the Board of Health engaged on yeah, a different level. So I'm, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah, they have jurisdiction beyond ours when it comes to especially private wells. Yeah, um, I think the, so the that private, is the alarming issue here. that Michelle highlighted earlier. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Laura, I, I see one one hand up. I know we're all going to drop off, but I'm going to just make one comment because I feel like there's this sort of, um, you know, in particular when it comes to solar here. Um, there's, um, I, I, I do hear a lot of, um, you know, fear-based dialogue um, just around the community. And I will say one thing that um, in our last solar working group discussion, Jack made a point in, uh, regarding water quality and said essentially that solar development, which I certainly know to be true, is the equivalent to grassland in terms of runoff and water quality. Um, as long as we don't clean chemicals in the ground. So I just want the commissioners to know that if, if there's a solar facility that we don't have jurisdiction over, it's not as though a ton of chemicals are running off into the ground and infiltrating groundwork. Um, and, you know, so anyways, I just want to put that out there and happy to discuss. I've been doing this for, you know, 17 years, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think my concern is more is jurisdictional. Um, and how we navigate this and just making sure that we're clear on our jurisdiction and um, making sure that the public is aware what our role is. Um, Michelle, I see you have a comment, but then guys, oh, I, sorry, I feel bad that, so that, that, I... that white paper um, does outline a lot of potential contamination sources that are not from the solar panels themselves. So mm -hmm. I agree that solar panels themselves do not have a lot of or any leaching but it's the maintenance and the other materials that it and the batteries that are potential contaminants. So that's all actually in the white paper. Um, and that's where, you know, I have concerns about the wells because they don't really tie that into groundwater potential contamination. So really it's on long-term maintenance rather than solar panels themselves. Okay. Thanks everyone for the dialogue on this. I think it sounds like we have a little bit of a plan maybe at our next, on the next November 9th meeting, will you add this to the kind of like other topics, Erin, on the agenda? And by then I will, that will remind me to figure out when the next meeting is. I was just looking at the website and so I'll be sure to figure out how to get in touch with that committee and just reach out and start a dialogue on this. Um, I'm sure that Everyone here has a shared goal and we just need to figure out how to best kind of locate ourselves in the situation. Um, so to be continued, but I think we should continue it <laughs> later. 
and, and call this meeting because it's late. And I really appreciate everyone's attention to all the detail on these hearings. This was a complicated meeting and this has been a really important discussion. So thank you. I'm sorry it's so late. Um, I, anything, what'd you say, Michelle? I was just jumping the gun. Oh yeah. I think we have to have a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn at um, 10, 9.45. We're still in the single digits, guys. We're doing well. 9.45 <laughs> on October 26, 2022. Seconded. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, voice vote. Michelle. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Laura. Aye. Alex. Yes, good night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's unanimous. Good night, everyone.